The transatlantic slave trade and the subsequent centuries of enslavement in the New World form a dark chapter in human history, revealing the depths to which cruelty, dehumanization, and exploitation can descend. While the abominations of forced labor, familial separations, and brutal physical punishment are well documented, the sexual exploitation of enslaved black individuals is a facet that deserves a deeper examination, not only because of its profound impact on the victims, but also due to its long-term societal ramifications. Sexual exploitation was deeply intertwined with the institution of slavery, representing another mechanism of control, power assertion, and economic benefit for slaveholders. The focus on the sexual abuse of enslaved women is often emphasized, and rightly so. Enslaved black women, positioned at the intersection of race and gender, faced systematic rape and sexual assault from slaveholders, overseers, and other white men who wielded power over them. These attacks were not just acts of lust or attraction, they were tools of terror, wielded to remind enslaved people of their subordinate status. Furthermore, the resulting offspring from such unions were a perverse economic boom for slaveholders, as these children, regardless of their often white paternity, were born into slavery and thus expanded the owner's human property and wealth. Before we continue, please don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel if you are yet to do so, to keep informed of our black narratives. The societal and legal systems of the time not only allowed such abuses, but actively facilitated them. In many colonies and states, laws dictated that the status of a child followed the condition of the mother, a principle known as partus sequitur ventrem. Hence, children born to enslaved women, even if fathered by white masters, remained enslaved. Such policies meant that sexual exploitation was not only a mechanism of power and control, but also an economic strategy to increase the enslaved population. The presence of lighter-skinned, mixed-race enslaved individuals known pejoratively as mulattoes in historical texts stands as a testament to the widespread sexual exploitation of black women. However, the narrative of sexual exploitation was not limited to black women alone. Enslaved black men, too, were victims of sexual abuse, a fact less frequently discussed in historical discourse. Male slaves faced coerced sexual relations, often organized by slaveholders for breeding purposes to produce more enslaved children. This organized and forced breeding stripped black men of their agency, reducing them to mere studs in the eyes of their oppressors. In other instances, black men faced sexual humiliation and assault as punishment or as perverse acts of dominance by both white men and women. The violation of black men served dual purposes. It was a tool of emasculation and a stark reminder of their powerless status. Moreover, the stereotypes that emerged during this era, portraying black men as hypersexualized, dangerous, and predatory, were, in part, a twisted projection of white fears and justifications for the continued subjugation and violence against black males. These stereotypes, alongside those that painted black women as inherently promiscuous or as Jezebels, have had a lasting impact, shaping racial perceptions and biases that persist even today. The sexual exploitation of enslaved people was a facet of enslavement in Virginia that took many forms for both women and men. Enslavers sexually assaulted and abused enslaved individuals, demanded reproduction from them to enhance their own bottom lines, and otherwise used the bodies of the enslaved for monetary gain, pleasure, and punishment. Western culture's objectification and sexualizing of black bodies worsened the sexual vulnerability of enslaved men and women. In addition to being detrimental to the well-being of enslaved people, Sexual exploitation strained marriages and other interpersonal relationships valued by enslaved people. The historical record speaks to the ubiquity of mixed-race sexual relationships in the era of slavery. Virginia had the largest number of mixed-race enslaved people of all the southern states, totaling approximately 44,000 in the year 1850. While some of these sexual relationships were long-term, and some enslaved men and women navigated sexually intimate relations with their enslavers and other white people in an effort to survive and secure better treatment. Historians question whether any relationships under such an unequal power dynamic can be considered consensual. As it was elsewhere, sexual violence was a ubiquitous component of enslavement throughout the history of slavery in Virginia. Enslavers exercised almost complete control over the bodies of enslaved individuals and the conditions of their existence providing themselves with numerous avenues for force and coercion in the intimate lives of the enslaved. The plantation culture itself, 
with its strict hierarchy of white male authority, emboldened enslavers to demean and dominate those over which they held power, and the law provided enslaved people with no protection from sexual violence. The rape of an enslaved woman was not a crime under most state laws. In George v. State, the Supreme Court of Mississippi ruled in 1859 that a black enslaved man could not be convicted of raping an enslaved woman because it was only a crime to commit a rape upon a white woman. Because of this absence of legal protection, historians lack an archive of legal cases to determine the extent of sexual violence against the enslaved and must rely on other evidence. For enslaved women in particular, slave narratives speak to the ubiquity and constant threat of sexual violence at the hands of enslavers, their family members, overseers, and others. As Harriet Jacobs wrote, My master was, to my knowledge, the father of eleven slaves. But did the mothers dare to tell us who was the father of their children? Did the other slaves dare to allude to it except in whispers among themselves? No, indeed. They knew too well the terrible consequences. More information on this can be found in her book, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, published 1861. Reverend Israel Massey, who was born into slavery in Emporia, recalled that enslavers and overseers would send slaves who are husbands out on the farm, milking cows or cutting wood. Then they would get in bed with their wives while they were away. Some women would fight and tussle. Others would be humble, terribly frightened of that beating. Elizabeth Keckley, who was born into slavery in the Piedmont region of Virginia, and taken by her enslavers to North Carolina, told in her narrative, Behind the Scenes, or Thirty Years a Slave and Four Years in the White House, 1868, of being repeatedly raped by the son of a wealthy plantation owner who lived nearby. Eventually she gave birth to son that he fathered. Indeed, the sons of enslavers often repeated the patterns of sexual exploitation they learned on the plantation. In 1826, two students at the University of Virginia raped a 16-year-old enslaved woman and later stripped her naked and beat her, forgiving them a venereal disease, as recounted by Alan Taylor in Thomas Jefferson's Education in 2019. Women were not the only ones who faced sexual assault. Harriet Jacobs noted that in addition to raping enslaved women, enslavers did in some cases exercise the same authority over the male slaves. In a 1787 incident in Maryland, an enslaved man was sexually assaulted when he was forced at gunpoint by two white men to rape a free black woman. As with enslaved women, fighting back was usually futile, as those who resisted would be whipped or sold to a plantation in the Lower South, separated from their families and consigned to a life of even harder labor. Nonetheless, some enslaved people did resist, self-emancipating, fighting back, or in extreme cases, resorting to the murder of their abusers. For many enslaved women, submitting to the sexual desires of their enslavers was the best among several bad options, including being physically punished until they relented or being sold off if they continued to refuse to submit. Some women made peace with their situation knowing it would result in better treatment, such as working in the house as a domestic servant for themselves and their children. Harriet Jacobs entered into a long-term relationship with a neighboring white man to stave off the repeated advances of her despised enslaver. Sexual exploitation was but one weapon used by enslavers to keep enslaved people subordinated and degraded. Enslavers benefited in many ways from the violations of black men's and women's bodies, including through physical and emotional gratification, reaping the power of victimizers, and the monetary profits associated with the reproduction of the enslaved. Western culture's objectification and sexualizing of black bodies contributed to the sexual vulnerability of enslaved men and women. Black women had long been depicted by early European travelers as especially fertile and hypersexual, a view that was carried over to enslaved women to justify sexual contact without consent. Both enslaved men and women endured violations of their bodies and a general lack of consideration for their privacy. They were scrutinized, groped, and objectified by enslavers. At slave auctions, black women were sometimes paraded with their bodies exposed to advertise their potential to bear children. Stripping enslaved people to whip them was a common sexualized humiliation added to corporal punishment. In addition, enslaved people often were provided with inadequate clothing, and this exposure contributed to their vulnerability. Traveling in 18th century Virginia, Francois-Jean de Chasteloup 
recorded seeing young Negroes from 16 to 20 years old with not an article of clothing but a loose shirt descending halfway down their thighs waiting at table. Enslavers had a financial interest in enslaved people's reproduction as children born to enslaved women inherited their mother's enslaved status. This natural increase, as it was termed, enriched enslavers' bottom lines. Nowhere was this more so than in Virginia and other states of the Upper South, where a large enslaved population, the ending of the transatlantic slave trade, and a declining agricultural sector combined to make it profitable for enslavers to sell their surplus slave labor to the booming cotton states of the Lower South. In 1832, during a debate over slavery in the House of Delegates, James H. Golson of Brunswick County compared enslavers' right to the increase of their enslaved women to that of the owner of broodmares, and noted that this increase consists of much of our wealth. During the same debate, Thomas Jefferson Randolph noted that 8,500 enslaved people were exported annually from Virginia to the Deep South and said, it is a practice and an increasing practice in parts of Virginia to rear slaves for market. Historians disagree about how systemic forced reproduction was, but it is clear from oral histories and other first-hand accounts that enslavers did engage in the practice. James Green, who was enslaved in Virginia, recalled that his master chooses the wife for every man on the place, he said in the old American vernacular tongue. No one had no say as to who he was going to get for a wife. All the wedding ceremony we had was with Moster's finger pointing out who was whose wife, he asserted. Will Ann Rogers remembered that her mother, who had been enslaved in Virginia, told her that her owner mated slaves like stock. Sam Everett, enslaved in Virginia, recalled that if there seemed to be any slight reluctance on the part of either of the unfortunate ones, Big Jim would make them consummate this relationship in his presence. He noted that this brought sadistic pleasure for the enslaver beyond the profits to be gained. He enjoyed these orgies very much and often entertained his friends in this manner. Quite often, he and his guests would engage in these debaucheries, choosing for themselves the prettiest of the young women. Enslaved women were commonly referred to in terms that reduced them to their reproductive capacity. Reverend Massey recalled hearing enslaved women sold at the local slave auction being referred to as a fine wench or a good breeder. Similarly, some enslaved men with imposing physical builds were used as stock men to impregnate a number of women with no regard for family connections. One slave recounted being forced to reproduce with 15 women and father dozens of children. Many enslavers may have been content to let enslaved individuals make their own mate choices. But even then, there was still coercion at work. As an enslaved teenage girl reached adulthood, she would have been aware that settling on a partner of her choice relatively quickly was better than having the choice made for her and that women who failed to reproduce were devalued substantially and often sold away from their families. Enslavers encouraged enslaved women to bear children in subtle and not so subtle ways. Many provided pregnant and nursing women with extra rations and reduced workloads. Some were known to make small presents to enslaved women when they had a baby. In 1792, a Virginia enslaver named B. Talbert promised an enslaved woman named Jenny that he would emancipate her and her sixth child if she would bear him five children, which, according to Deborah Gray White, he did in 1803. Long-term relationships between enslavers and enslaved people occurred throughout the era of slavery. As historian Brenda Stevenson noted, these relationships ran the gamut from rape and sodomy to romance, from chance encounters to obsessions, concubinage, and even marriage. Historians have argued about whether any of these relationships, even ones characterized by a degree of choice and tenderness, can be called consensual within the confines of slavery. I think not so. In acknowledging the sexual exploitation of both black men and women during the era of slavery, we confront the multifaceted dimensions of dehumanization that marked this period. It becomes essential to understand these atrocities, not just as historical facts, but as foundational traumas that shaped generations of black lives contributing to the complex tapestry of racial relations, gender dynamics, and societal structures in the present day. The brutal institution of slavery left an indelible mark on the African diaspora, with the sexual exploitation of enslaved black men and women serving as one of its most insidious manifestations. This exploitation, however, was not merely a series of isolated incidents. It reverberated throughout generations, shaping identities, relationships, and societal perceptions leaving a legacy that persists to this day.
generational trauma, the direct victims of sexual exploitation endured unimaginable physical and psychological trauma. This trauma was passed down through generations, manifesting as deep-seated pain, mistrust, and heightened vulnerability among descendants of those who were enslaved. Contemporary discussions on generational trauma often trace back to the collective experiences of pain and violation that black ancestors underwent. Racial dynamics and stereotypes. The stereotypes that arose from this period played a significant role in shaping racial dynamics in the U.S. and elsewhere. Black women, often perceived as hypersexual Jezebels or nurturing mammies, were pigeonholed into roles that simultaneously desexualized and hypersexualized them. Black men were often depicted as aggressive sexual predators, a stereotype that has been invoked time and again to justify racial violence, especially lynching during the Jim Crow era. These perceptions played into societal narratives casting black individuals as other and served as a basis for racial discrimination. Mixed race populations, the children resulting from the sexual exploitation of enslaved women by their white masters added to the mixed race population. These individuals often referred to historically as mulattoes, sometimes occupied unique social positions, being neither wholly accepted by white nor black communities. Their presence highlighted the complicated racial hierarchies of the time, with some being granted privileges based on their lighter skin leading to nuanced colorism issues within the black community, issues that still persist today. Distorted family structures. The sexual exploitation of enslaved individuals led to complicated familial structures. Children born from such unions were sometimes raised alongside their half-siblings, with one being a slave and the other a master. Additionally, enslaved women who bore children from their masters might have had their families separated or sold off, intensifying the already pervasive disintegration of black familial bonds. Economic impact. Sexual exploitation had tangible economic effects. Children born as a result of such relationships increased the number of slaves, and thus the wealth of the slaveholder. This perverse incentive further entrenched the institution of slavery, making abolition efforts even more challenging. Cultural and identity effects. The blending of African and European cultures, though birthed from traumatic circumstances, gave rise to rich tapestries of cultural and artistic expression, especially in the realms of music, dance, and art. The struggles and resilience of those who endured these atrocities were often memorialized in spirituals, blues, and later genres like jazz. Psychological aftermath. The dehumanization inherent in sexual exploitation left profound psychological scars. Enslaved individuals grappled with issues of self-worth, identity, and a deep sense of violation. The legacy of this psychological trauma is evident in the racial disparities in mental health outcomes seen even today, with black communities disproportionately grappling with issues stemming from historical oppression. In essence, the sexual exploitation of black men and women during the slave era was not merely a historical atrocity. Its effects ripple through time, influencing contemporary racial dynamics, societal structures, and individual identities. Recognizing and addressing this dark legacy is crucial in understanding present-day issues faced by the black community and in forging a path toward healing and equity. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to smash the like button if you are yet to do so. See you in the next video.